Shout out to Tyler, everybody. Shout out to Tyler. Thank you for joining us at Hebrew Readers Church. We just hope that I have been prospering, everybody. Well, today we're going into signs to identify the tribes. This is part three of the series. We apologize for the quality of the audio in this lesson, but I have will, and hopefully you can bear with us. Well, if you haven't seen Science to Identify the Tribe, please go check it out, and you can continue on with this lesson so that you can understand where we are in that lesson. So, I'm your brother, Zach Wah, and I'm your brother, Kasapo. All right, and we are Hebrew Readers, Hebrew Readers Church. Um, all right, you want to go ahead and get started? Yes. All right, so we left off. We discussed the characteristics of the tribes and how they've been scattered all over, different things of that nature in the prior videos. And here we're going to identify the Israelites by the curses that were prophesied to be upon them in the books of the law of Moses. And it's important because according to scripture, this was a definite way for us to know who the Israelites are, it will be a sign, the, the curses that were written will be a sign upon them. Can you read uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 45 to 47 please? Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee, and shall pursue thee, and shall overtake thee, till thou be destroyed. Because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of Ahiah the Elohim to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder, and upon thy seed forever. And there we see the curses are following us, no matter where we go, so long as we're in disobedience, those curses would follow, and it will be a sign upon our seed forever. Hence, you can always identify us by these things, especially when we're in disobedience, particularly. Verse 47, Because thou servest not Ahiah the Elohim with joyfulness, and with gladness of heart, and with abundance of all things. So you can confirm scripturally that this is indeed a way of identifying us, and that when we're in iniquity, these curses cleave to us. Because when we look in the book of Baruch, in the Apocrypha, he also spoke of these curses taking hold of us when we started to sin in the uh, Babylonian captivity. Uh, can you read the book of Baruch, chapter 1, verse 19 to 22, and chapter 2, verse 1? Tonight, please. The book of Baruch, chapter 1, verse 19. Since the day that Ahiah brought our forefathers out of the land of Egypt unto this present day, we have been disobedient unto Ahiah our Elohim, and we have been negligent in not hearing his voice. Wherefore the evils cleaved unto us, and the curse which Ahiah appointed by Moses his servant at the time that he brought our fathers out of the land of Egypt to give us a land that flows with milk and honey like as it is to see this day. Nevertheless, we have not hearkened unto the voice of Ahiah our Elohim according unto all the words of the prophet whom he sent unto us. But every man followed the imagination of his own wicked heart to serve strange Elohim and to do evil in the sight of Ahiah our Elohim. Now that lets us know that idolatry that we would be in is not only relegated to worshiping an actual statue but literally walking according to the imagination of our own heart is idolatry as well. So that'll show how doing things our own way or however we feel about it, that's not a part of the idolatry that we would be in wherever we go. Right, continue, please. The Book of Barnabas, chapter 2, verse 1. This is Baruch, I'm sorry. The writer said Barnabas before. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, the Book of Barnabas, chapter 2, verse 1. I'm sorry, this is Baruch. The writer said Barnabas. Baruch. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is the book of Baruch, chapter 2, <laughs> verse 1. Therefore, Ahiah hath made good his word, which he pronounced against us, and against our judges that judge Israel, and against our kings, and against our princes, and against the men of Israel and Judah, to bring upon us great plagues such as never happened under the whole heaven as it came to pass in Jerusalem, according to the things that were written in the law of Moses, that a man should eat the flesh of his own son and the flesh of his own daughter. Moreover, he hath delivered them to be in subjection to all the kingdoms that are round about us, to be as a reproach and desolation among all the people round about, where Ahiah hath scattered them. So that lets you know the thing with the Israelites 
we would be afflicted everywhere we are in the world, be in subjection to all the nations we dwell among. That's a key thing to understand who the Israelites are because there are many nations who have been enslaved by their own people and things of that nature, gone through struggles, captivities, like even the Syrians were taken off in captivity in the scriptures, but they returned to their land. The difference is with the Israelites, they would be subjugated everywhere they would go in these times. Baruch chapter 2 verse 5. Thus we were cast down and not exalted. Because we have sinned against Ahayah our Elohim, and have not been obedient unto his voice. To Ahayah our Elohim of appertaineth righteousness, but unto us and our fathers open shame as appeareth this day. For all these plagues are come upon us, which Ahayah hath pronounced against us. Yet have we not prayed before Ahayah, that we might turn every one from the imaginations of his wicked heart. Wherefore Ahia watched over us for evil, and Ahia hath brought it upon us. For Ahia is righteous in all his works which he hath commanded us. In verse 8 of Baruch chapter 2, it really helps show how one of the biggest problems for the Israelites in the idolatry that we've been in that has caused us to be in this captivity is that we have walked according to the imaginations of our own heart. Being wise in our own mind is one of our biggest stumbling blocks that cause us to have gone through all the things that we have gone through over the years and what we're going through now as well. Now let's look at the curses that will be assigned upon us for our disobedience to identify the sons of Jacob and earth. We're going to read through Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 15 to 68 and we're going to be jumping around for some precepts to understand the conditions that the uh, Israelites will be in as a part of these curses that are upon them. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 15 but it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of Ahiah the Elohim to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. There we see it's very straight that these curses, once we're in disobedience, these curses are going to come upon us. But we can jump to, let's go verse 16 and 17, please. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. We will not prosper in our business affairs. Also, curses that will be upon us, our children will be lawless and filled with evil spirits instead of the Holy Spirit, like our forefathers. Can you read Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 18, please? Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body. That's the children. Continue, please. And the fruit of thy land, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. And that was pertaining to our business. We wouldn't prosper in anything. Now, pertaining to the fruit of our bodies, when we look at the Acts of Thomas chapter 12, we're going to see how by the parents walking in iniquity, because we've seen that these curses are because of our disobedience, that iniquity affects the children. And this is why people's children get afflicted with demons, some seen and some unseen, from a young age. So we can understand when I say, curse of your fruit of thy body, why a lot of the things are happening among us as they are today. Right. This is the Acts of Thomas chapter 12. Remember my children, what my brother said to you, and to whom he commanded you, and know if you are framed from this filthy intercourse you become temples holy and pure, being released from afflictions and troubles known and unknown, and you will not be involved in the cares of this life and of children whose end is destruction. So he was admonishing this couple before they were going to get married for lust's sake. If they would refrain from doing it for lust and take the time to get to know each other and get to know Allah in truth, that they would be delivered from the afflictions of the world and children whose end was going to be in destruction because they were filled with evil spirits. Continue, please. But if you get many children for their sakes, you become grasping and avaricious, plundering orphans and deceiving widows. And by doing this, you subject yourself to the most grievous punishment. So this is showing how people do things that they shouldn't do with the mindset that this is for my children. And really, they're setting themselves up for the punishment in the afterlife. For most children become unprofitable, being possessed by demons, some openly and some secretly. And that's the key. And we're going to see the difference to see the, what is openly and what is some secretly to know how people are being possessed to this day, though we don't know it. Mm -hmm. For they become either lunatics, or half-withered, or crippled, or deaf, or dumb, 
or paralytics or idiots. That's the open demonic possession. Continue, please. And though they be healthy, they will be again good for nothing. So those that may not have the open demonic possession, they're still going to be good for nothing because they're going to have the secret demonic possession, which are the doing unprofitable and abominable works so there we see working iniquity is showing that we have well, under demonic possession continue please for they will be detected either in adultery or in murder or in theft or in unchastity so there we see things that are looked at today like they're common crimes yeah. are actually demonic possessions as well all right continue please and by all these you will be afflicted you know, the parents they always have to struggle with the choices their children made Children may have done something to get arrested and things of that nature. And the parents are afflicted with dealing with what their child is going through or has done. Right, continue, please. But if you obey and preserve your souls pure to Elohim, there will be born to you living children. So there we see, if we obey the commandments, he will bless the fruit of our womb. And then our children will be living. They'll have the spirit of life, that Holy Spirit. And they will walk uprightly and not be under any possession untouched by these hurtful things and you will be without care spending an untroubled life free from grief and care looking forward to receive that incorruptible and true marriage and you will enter as a groomsman into the bridal chamber full of immortality and life and you see that's the call of us that we walk in belief so hopefully that helps understand when he talks about curse of be the fruit of thy body in deuteronomy 28 and 18 you can understand that it literally is our children will curse with physical ailments behavioral issues unable to walk in the commandments and mental health issues being afflicted with the spirits that attack the respective tribes of the children of israel and we're going to learn about those spirits when we go forward into the lessons on the tribes individually we ourselves being a product of the curses of our fathers and whatnot we understand being under the influences that we were under and the decisions we made before the actually was gracious to show us ourselves so that we could turn from it by his grace. To work through these struggles, striving for righteousness through faith in his name, that we may be delivered by him working in us to make us perfect. Picking back up at Deuteronomy 28 and 19 to 21, we could also see that we won't be able to get ahead because we are read in Deuteronomy 28 and 18 how he will also curse the fruit of our land, the increase of our kind, and the flocks of the, our sheep. So everything that we're trying to get ahead in, it wouldn't prosper. And we continue to see that as you go forward. Deuteronomy 28 and 19. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. Ahia shall sin upon thee, cursing, vexation, and rebuke, in all that thou settest thy hand unto for it to do, until thou be destroyed, and until thou perish quickly. Because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken this. So we see why we get withheld from getting ahead. In today's society, it can be something like you're trying to get a business going and everything's looking good. And then there's that certain paperwork you needed to get and the door got shut and they blew it. Or you get everything going and then it's that last hurdle and you can't get over it. So, so continue, please. Deuteronomy 28 and 21. Ahia shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee, until he hath consumed thee from off the land, whether thou goest to possess it. Verse 22, please. Ahia shall smite thee with a consumption, and with a fever, and with an inflammation, and with an extreme burning, and with the sword, and with blasting, and with mildew, and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. Now, looking from what he said, we will be disease-stricken in the lands we fled to, as well as consumed. You have been afflicted by the sword. You had Columbus in 1492. Also, as I said, he will cause the pestilence to cleave unto us, the consumption, the fever, and these diseases. Columbus in 1492 came to the Americas with the measles, the fever, smallpox in Americas. Then you had when they brought the uh, inhabitants of the southern kingdom over from sub-Saharan Africa. You had the syphilis and the Tuskegee experiments and the HIV with the slaves. And then... Here in recent times, you have Ebola in West Africa, where the slaves are, the children of Israel, and also malaria in West Africa as well. And then they went to the children of Israel, uh, the ten tribes down there uh, in South America with the Zika virus. So you can see how Ahia said the curses will be upon us for our sins, and he's fulfilling it. 
for unrighteousness. You also had in the 1800s, they had tuberculosis, measles, chicken pox, cholera, whooping cough, and flu in Australia. And if anyone is familiar with the aboriginals, they almost wiped them all out. And uh, in the 19th century, there was the measles and influenza in the Pacific Islands. And the sword showed we would also be colonizing these lands, not the colonizers. So you can see the people that came to take over all these lands outside of the allotment of the sons of Noah, they knew who they were coming for. That's why it's predominantly the ten horns that came out to get the children of Israel that were in the Pacific Indian Ocean Islands, the Caribbean Sea, and in the Americas, and also in Sub-Saharan Africa. There was no confusion for them who they were taking over. Continuing in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, Verse 23 to 25, please. Deuteronomy 28 and 23. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. How they say between a rock and a hard place. Right. Right. Things just can't seem to change. We're always in the same situation. All right. Continue, please. Ahiah shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. Ahiah shall cause thee to be smitten before thy enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them, and flee seven ways before them, and shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. So there we see, sign upon the Israelites, hardship, famine, defeated in war, then enslaved. This brought all Israelites under the hands of the Gentiles. And you can find us all over the world because of these things. Uh, touching on Deuteronomy 28 and 25. It said, Thou shalt go out one way against them. So every time we will rise up to fight against our enemy, we're literally, we'll be fleeing seven ways before them. So it showed that we would never overcome our enemy. So I thought that was interesting. It was very much confirms who we are today. Right. Because we still haven't been able to get out of the grip of our enemies. So long as we're in iniquity, we can't rise. And Moses was the testimony of that right, when the rod, right, with the war with uh, when Amalek came. Whenever Moses' hand was held up, the Israelite prospered. Whenever his hand came down, they couldn't win. It was a foreshadowing to know that it's only through the right hand of Allah can we be delivered through Yahweh, our King. Faith in Him and obedience. Uh, the book of Enoch, chapter 89, verse 54. And after I saw that when they forsook the house of Ahiah and his tower, they fell away entirely, and their eyes were blinded. And I saw the Adonah of the sheep, how he wrought much slaughter among them in their herds, until those sheep invited that slaughter and betrayed this place. There we see, this is now, this vision that Enoch saw was seeing how the Adonah of the sheep had given us over the slaughter for our iniquities, and then we were so stiff-necked and bold that we welcomed it. We didn't change. We just was like, well, it is what it is. And we stayed in our iniquity. And we're going to see what continues to happen to us. And he gave them over into the hands of the lion and tiger, and wolves and hyenas. Now those lion and tigers, that was when the Assyrian and Babylonian captivity came in. So you can see how we had started off in this gross iniquity from a long time ago. All right, continue, please. And into the hand of foxes, into all the wild beasts, and those wild beasts began to tear in pieces those sheep. And I saw that he forsook that their house and their tower, and gave them all into the hands of the lions to tear and devour them. That's the Babylonians, right? Continue, please. Into the hand of all the wild beasts. And I began to cry aloud with all my power, and to appeal to the Adonor of the sheep, and to represent to him in regard to the sheep that they were devoured by all the wild beasts. But he remained unmoved, though he saw it, and rejoiced that they were devoured, and swallowed, and robbed, and left them to be devoured in the hand of all the beasts. And he called seventy shepherds, and cast those sheep to them, that they might pasture them. And he spake to the shepherds and their companions. So those were the seventy angels that he gave us over to from the time after the Babylonian captivity. You can see how we've been given into the hand of the nation from that time going forward. Continue, please. Let each individual of your pastor the sheep hint forward, and everything that I shall command you that do ye, and I will deliver them over unto you, duly numbered, and tell you which of them are to be destroyed, and them destroy ye. 
And he gave over unto them those sheep, and he called another and spake unto him. Observe and mark everything that the shepherd would do to those sheep, for they would destroy more of them than I have commanded them. In every excess and the destruction which will be wrought through the shepherds, record how many they destroy according to my command, and how many according to their own caprice. Record against every individual shepherd all the destruction he effects. They received the 70 angels. He actually told them who had to die and who shouldn't. And he also called another angel to record them secretly to see how many more they were going to kill that he didn't tell them to kill because he knew they would fall the affliction. You have the opportunity you can uh, read that uh, vision of Enoch to get the rest of that. But we just went there to see how that was being given into all the nations of the earth. And hence, you will find the Israelites scattered as they went to try to rise up against their enemies, having to flee seven ways against them, not being able to overcome and still being under the hand of their enemies to this day. I guess to give a proper retrospect, the 70 angels were the ones that were after the Tower of Babylon. When Ahiah confounded the languages, Nimrod was the first to choose the angel that he was going to worship, and the rest of the 70 nations chose the angel that they were going to worship. So you can see that the 70 angels are the 70 nations that were put over us to afflict us. So this is what Enoch was saying. In these end times, you had the four beasts of Daniel, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. From the scriptures, it was shown in 2nd Ezra chapter 6, verse 9, that Edom will be the end of the world, and Jacob that, that followeth. And as we read before in the lessons in uh, Psalms 83, that Edom was the chief. You know, the tabernacles of Edom was the first in this confederacy to cut off the children of Israel from being a nation. We know Rome had took their time, took their dominion. There was a time in 193, 192 or 193 AD when Septimius Severus and Claudius Albinus and uh, Piscius Niger had pulled a coup in Rome and destabilized the government and from then on started to build what would become known as the Holy Roman Empire, which was a time of people of color ruling. This was the time of that seventh king according to Revelation 17 and 10 that was to rule and continue for a short space. But there will come a time when Edom would rise again from their poverty, as is shown in the scriptures, to rule again. Because they have to fulfill the prophecy that says Edom is the end of the world. Going back into the scriptures and looking at war history, how these things came about, you had the barbarian tribes in the Dark Age began to rise back up in about the 4th or 5th century from being impoverished in Europe to destabilize the Holy Roman Empire over a process of time to subdue, expel, and destroy the Hebrews that resided in Europe. King James and his son Charles were some of the last Hebrews that ruled in Europe. This is why Oliver Cromwell is such a major name in history, because he had beheaded King James' son, and that was a major event of getting rid of the Israelites out of Europe and out of rulership in Europe. And the scriptures foretold of how Edom would be impoverished, but then they would rise back up. You can look at that in Malachi chapter 1, verse 4, please. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith Ahiah of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the borders of wickedness. And the people against whom I had indignation forever. Now this verse is interesting because they were impoverished. And then they said, we shall build the desolate places. They took back over. And then it goes on to say, they shall build. So Edom is going to complete what they're doing. And then Ahia is going to throw it down. And why would they be called the border of wickedness? Because Edom is prophesied, according to Jubilees, chapter 36, verse 34, to sin a complete sin unto death. They're going to set up matters of impurity in the guise of purity, according to Gad the seer. Chapter 1, verse 8 to 10, where it said, A mixture from seer to roll over them to increase power over a righteous doer and thus to betray, to destroy holiness, to crown wickedness, to set up matters of impurity in the guise of purity. Sadly, it's his nation that's going to establish the kingdom of the beast 
as Revelations chapter 17 talks about the ten horns. Those are the, those angels over the ten founding members of the Western European Union that are going to give their strength and power unto the beast to have their one hour with the beast. This is why Edom is called the border of wickedness. Thankfully, not all Edom is a part of it because there is a remnant of Edom that is called by Ahiah's name according to Amos chapter 9 about verse 11 and 12. They will be counted for the seed of Abraham by faith in Yahshua Christ, according to the grace of Allah Hayim, for Abraham, Isaac, the fathers of both Esau and Jacob's children. You can further confirm that Edom will have a remnant to be saved as well, because according to our law, in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 7 and 8, we are not to hate Edom because he is our brother, and in the third and fourth generation their children shall enter the congregation. For our comfort to know that Ahia has had mercy on our brother Edom as well. Now, also, remember, it was not only Edom that was a part of that confederacy and that one consent to cut the children of Israel off from being a nation. So you can understand, though Edom's posterity, like Amalek, is the first, they're not the only ones in this effort to destroy the children of Israel. Edom's nation is just the one ruling the world, controlling from different places like the different countries of the ten horns to take over and accomplish what's to come here in the end. I hope it doesn't confuse one when one hears Edom was in different places because the children of Edom have been known to fight against each other even from the days of the scripture. If you look at Joshua 57 and 25 you'll find when Edom is in necessity they'll turn on each other looking out for us in their best interest. Hence, ruling from different places, they're fighting amongst each other because everyone's looking out for their self, even though there's one common goal to come here in the end. There are certain tribes among the children of Edom that have higher stature among the children of Esau, specifically more so the children of Eliphaz. And his children, that lineage of the children of Esau is the more chief of the children of Edom. And when you look at who was chief in the taking over of the Americas and the enslaving of the Aboriginal peoples of the Americas, the Pacific Islands, the Indian Ocean Islands, and the Caribbean Islands, and also those nations who were chief in uh, subduing the inhabitants of Sub-Saharan Africa and colonizing those areas, you would find that the Portuguese, Spain, England, France, and Dutch colonized Africa for slaves in the 15th to 18th century. These are all a part of the Ten Horns. And then you had the Berlin Conference in 1884 in Germany where the European countries divided Africa. You also had the Spanish, French, and British colonize the Americas in 1492. The British colonized Australia starting around the 1770s and New Zealand by 1840. The Dutch, French, and British colonized the Indian Ocean Islands starting in the 16th century. Spain colonized the Philippines under Ferdinand Magellan in 1565. The Dutch colonized Indonesia in the 16th century. Melanesia colonized by the Ten Horns in the 18th century. Spain colonized Macronesia in the 17th century. We have Britain, Spain, and France colonized Polynesia. You can see the consistency of the nations that are doing the colonizing because they knew exactly who they were going for. And scripturally, you can easily identify who it was because these were the ten horns of that fourth beast taking over, subduing the saints and subduing the earth as the scriptures foretold them to seek to do. Along with our curses, we would not only be given over to the fallen ones as you read about in the book of Enoch, but also to the evil spirits of the earth as well with no advocate to deliver us from them. Can you read Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 26 please? And thy carcass shall be meat unto all the fowls of the air, and unto the beasts of the earth, and no man shall fright them away. We literally have been meat for the creatures you can find in the American Holocaust books, them feeding the limbs of the natives to the dogs. You can also find slaves hanging on trees with birds eating their eyes out and such, and also being mangled by dogs and such. So these prophecies literally did happen, but also there's a spiritual aspect to it as well because he said our dead carcasses shall be meat and according to shepherd of hermas parable 9 chapter 16 
verse 3, the angel said, Before a man saith he has borne the name of the son of Allah, he is dead. But when he received the seal, he layeth aside his deadness and resumeth life. So without the receiving of the name of Christ Yache and the baptism, we are dead. And our dead carcasses will be meat for the fowls of the air. That's the fallen angels that we were given over to. And unto the beasts of the earth. That's the evil spirits that came from the giants. In Jubilees, you can read Jubilees chapter 10 and Enoch chapter 15 verse 8 to see how those beasts, those evil spirits in the earth are the children of the fallen angels, their spirits. And no man shall fray them away. That will show no one would deliver us. Because without Yahshua the angel that intercedes for us, we couldn't be delivered. The Testament of Levi, chapter 5, verse 6, please. And he said, I am the angel who intercedeth for the nation of Israel, that they may not be smitten utterly, for every evil spirit attacketh it. So that's Yahshua. He was telling Levi that he was the one that intercedes for Israel, because every evil spirit attacks us. And you can see how from the curses, when we're in disobedience, our carcass is given over to all these evil ones. Also, can you read uh, Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 3 and 4, please? Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 3. And I will appoint over them four kinds, saith Ahiah, the sword to slay, and the dogs to tear, and the fowls of heaven, and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. We have seen the dogs tearing the native Indians and being unleashed on the Hebrews during the civil rights movement. So we were literally having dogs tearing us up, not only being destroyed by the spirits, but also physically as well. Continue, please. And I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth, because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. And this is why the afflictions that we have seen in world history have been worse on the people known as the slaves because they are the inhabitants of Jerusalem who sinned worse by the deeds of Manasseh. Now, these principalities, not only will we mention how the dogs tearing the people up, people are also under the physical abuse of being possessed by demonic spirits which led them to sin. If you touch Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 to 3, please. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. There we see it was that principality, the prince of the air, that had us walking in disobedience to see the secret possessions that we were under. The very spirit of disobedience working us to walk according to the world, that's also showing that we are still under the curse. So you see one of us that's very worldly, it's showing this curse is still upon us. Because these fowls and beasts are still feeding on our dead carcass, keeping us from coming to receive the name of Yahshua and his baptism, that we may be alive again. Continue, please. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh. So we all know how to identify because we also walked in the same thing, in the lust of our flesh. Continue, please. Fulfilling the desire for the flesh and of the mind. Doing whatever we want according to our desire and our thoughts. Which we know from Baruch is idolatry. And specifically in this case, we can see we were serving the spirit of the air by walking in this disobedience. Continue, please. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. There we see that we were also under the curse of soul. We can identify when someone else is struggling with the principalities of the end of demonic spirits and knowing it having been through it ourselves working to overcome our own strongholds knowing the spirits we struggle with according to the tribes and even for the nations who are overcoming their struggles that they face being under principalities just the same it really helps us have compassion because we know we ourselves are no better we've also been in the same position we've also made bad choices too it really helps us abound in the fruits of the Spirit and the mercy towards others who have not been exposed to the light of Yahshua as yet. And it's more encouraging for us to set that example in hopes that Yahshua may manifest himself unto them as well. Because Ahaya has no pleasure in death of him than Daya. Now, even seeing how these principalities have been working so hard in America, it's the worst place in the world, according to the scriptures. 
because we had read about these fowls of the air, these unclean birds, which are speaking of these principalities, these fallen angels. But America is the chief place for it. Let's look at Revelations 18 and 2, please. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the inhabitant of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. That's the principalities. There we see for those that were raised in America, or that are in America, and still are raised there and still there, or are just dwelling there now, that's the toughest place to be in the world, according to Scripture. When battling evil spirits and being tempted to fall into many evils, America is the toughest. So the Israelites are in a very tough case in America. Let's continue reading uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 27 to 28, please. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 27. Ahia will smite thee with the box of Egypt, and with the emerald, and with the scab, and with the itch, whereof thou we'll canst see. not be healed. You see, we'll be suffering diseases. We have a lot of medical issues. Continue, please. Ahia shall smite thee with madness, and blindness, and astonishment of heart. Now that was interesting because people literally went crazy in slavery and in colonization around the world. But also that madness and blindness and astonishment of heart can also come from people being given over to evil spirits. The patriarchs talked about how Levi, for example, mentioned how the blindness that comes from unholiness or Dan spake on how the spirit of anger is blindness. And the different patriarchs spake of how they were blinded by different spirits so that we can understand this blindness that we're being smitten with to make us mad is also speaking of being overcome with evil spirits. We even seen how envy takes over the whole mind of a man and blinds him and makes savage his soul when reading the Testament of Simeon to understand these curses that are happening are not merely the world standard of crazy but also being overcome with evil spirits blinds the mind. Being sent from the Allahim of this world who's blinding us from seeing the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, as Paul speaks of in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So it's not merely, literally, just absolutely crazy, as in uh, open demonic possession, but it also can be a secret too, where you're just in unbelief. You don't believe in Allah, maybe an atheist, or maybe you have created your own religion. But in the sight of Allah, that's mad. Being drunk with the wine of Babylon, which make all nations mad, just like I said in Jeremiah 51 and 7. So these curses are is manifold on what's upon the children of Israel on the earth today. Continuing in uh, verse 29 of Deuteronomy 28, please. And thou shalt grope at noonday, and at the blind gropest in darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways. And thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. Our life was misery and oppression. Now, the whole world is going through tough times, but the difference is the children of Israel will only be oppressed. So we will never rise up from the hands of our enemies, but will always be oppressed under them. And this is key for identifying the Israelites. Everyone looks into slavery and what happened to the natives and whatnot around the world and the indigenous people. It was oppression and misery. We are the reproach of the earth around the world, oppressed with drugs, alcohol, and cheap labor and no resources to excel because of our sins. So hopefully we can understand it's not something that the nations have done to us and they won't help us. It's actually us. Our iniquities have put us in this place. That's why Ahaya hasn't given us help to get us out of the situation we're in. Because as we turn our back on him, continue in verse uh, 30 and 31, please. Deuteronomy 28 and 30. Thou shalt betroth a wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build an house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shalt not gather the grapes thereof. This happened in slavery. Very straight for those who are familiar with slave history. And these things still happen today with the spirit of promiscuity, where the infidelity in the households, also with the laborers, you know, the labor force, working to build houses, but not the ones that live in it, working to help build up businesses and establishments, but not profiting from it, right? Building the most extravagant houses, but you can't afford it, right? Yes, uh, continue, please. 
Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass shall be violently taken away from before thy face, and shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep shall be given unto thy enemies, and thou shalt have none to rescue them. There we see the Hebrews will be treated unfairly around the world, will be treated unjustly in every in their dealings, yet there is none to help because this is for our sins. Um, we have no voice to stand up for us. Our oppression all these years has not been viewed as a humanitarian crisis, which helps you separate the children of Israel from the rest of the nation. Because no, no one has came to help the Israelites that were taken in slavery and the Israelites that were enslaved while dwelling in the Americas and in the islands and the Polynesian islands and whatnot to this day. So you can see the difference between the nation's uh, respect for what's happening to the other nations as opposed to the children of Israel. Continue, please. Deuteronomy 28 and 32. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in thy hand. The fruit of thy land, and all thy labors, shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed always, so that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. And you can also find among the children of Israel self-hatred, and also hatred for the brethren and for all others, hatred for their neighbor. Through the oppression that they've been through, through all the afflictions, the lack of being able to provide for one's family and all these different things, they created self-hatred. Hence, we're against each other and we're against everyone else as well. It's an every man for himself mindset. They're what they will call a crab in a bucket mentality. Let's continue, please. Deuteronomy 28 and 35. A higher shall smite thee in the knees and, and in the legs with a sore box that cannot be healed, from the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head. Ahia shall bring thee, and thy king which thou shalt set over thee, unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, and there shalt thou serve other Elohims, wood and stone. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations, where thy highest shall lead thee. There we see we would be an astonishment to the world as to why we are so destroyed and still have yet to overcome. Still can't get ahead as a people. And that is really evident when you look at the Hebrews as one nation. Everywhere we are, we can't get ahead. We've been subdued and we're still the lesser in the societies where we dwell respectively. That's an astonishment after all this time where you have other nations can come to the countries where we've been enslaved in and have success while we've been there the whole time and can't get out of the rut that we are in. So we can identify us through what the Ahaya foretold to follow us. We are also being called by a byword and proverb and whatnot. We are being called by other names and taunts around the world as well. So that lets us know we won't be called Israel. We won't be called the Hebrews or the Jews and whatnot around the world. Jump to James chapter 1 verse 1 and chapter 2 verse 5 because we want to touch on that to understand that the people that are being called the Jews and whatnot today aren't the real Jews according to scripture. Because this known that we'll be called a taunt and a byword and, and proverb, this confirms the people claiming to be the Jews are not the Hebrews of the Bible because the true Hebrews are the poor of the earth. As you can see the curses that will be upon us no way we could be the most wealthy in society today. Um, go ahead with James, please. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, the servant of Elohim, and of the Lord, Yahweh Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not Elohim chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith? So you see, we weren't rich in wealth, we were rich in faith, because there's a remnant of Israel. We're looking at the children of Israel and identifying that when James is speaking specifically to the children of Israel, speaking to that remnant, they would not be people of wealth in the world. They would be the poor of the world, rich in faith, right? An heir to the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. So we see who Ahia's chosen people are out of the Israelites. They would be the poor, rich in faith. Now, let's go to Revelation chapter 2 and 9 
to see how Adonai differentiates the true Israelites as opposed to those who claim they are Jews. Revelation chapter 2 verse 9. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. When we've seen the curses that we've been in, we've been reading over the curses. You can see the works that we have to work to overcome the tribulation we are in. He's seeing what we're doing. He's seeing the effort we're making. He says we're rich because we're rich in faith. That means we're working the works of faith to come out of the curses that we've been under. Continue, please. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, but are not. But are the synagogue of Satan. So there is a nation that's claiming to be Jews, but they actually are the synagogue of Satan. The scriptures showed there was only one other nation in the scriptures that took it upon themselves to be the new chosen people. To understand who this nation is that's claiming to be the Jews today. Gabbesia chapter 2 verse 15, verse 17 to 20, and verse 24 to 25, please. Gabbesia chapter 2 verse 15. Woe to you, O Edom, that sits in the land of Kittim, in the north of the sea. Notice, Edom had moved to the north of the sea. North of the Mediterranean is Europe. The land of Kittim is Italia. And when you read the scriptures, the children of Chittim, or Kittim, had also taken over not only Italia and the surrounding islands, that's the islands of the Mediterranean, they also took over uh, Britannia, where the children of Elisha were. So Edom was already starting to spread into Europe. This is in the days of Gad, King David. Right? This is prophecy speaking to them. Continue, please. Uh, Gad, the third chapter 2, verse 17. For you have said, On high is my seat, and I have knowledge of the Elohim of Elohim. For Ahia chose me instead of his holy people. For he loathed them. See, Edom was the one to declare that Ahia chose them instead of his holy people. These are the people that ascribe themselves as the chosen people. So one can scripture understand. Who is that nation that says they are Jews and are not? Right? Continue, please. And his former people despised and rejected, did not know Ahia or his image. So when they saw that we had been despised for our sins and rejected, kicked out of the land, they had took it upon themselves to ascribe themselves as the chosen people. Continue, please. Verily we are wise and clever. And they did it with subtlety, with guile. All right, continue, please. We know Ahia and his law. And they ascribe themselves to know it. Hence, they are so zealous and pharisaical in their approach to the law, which is hypocritical in their approach to the law to seem righteous, but it's not according to the truth of the gospel. Continue, please. We know his image and presence. Therefore, thus saith Ahia, because you rose so high to talk about the Elohim of Elohim, Know that you shall perish in your cleverness. Because sadly, what they're doing through their cleverness, they're actually setting up matters of impurity in the guise of purity. This is why they shall perish in their cleverness. All right, continue, please. O oh, jealous Ahia, come out. Come out of your place and thrash Edom. Consume them. Now, scripturally, you can also confirm who the people that say they are Jews and are not today are these children of Edom because the scripture also shows where Edom will be coming from. Because today you have the Sephardic Jews and the Ashkenazi Jews as the two main groups of the people who ascribe themselves as Jews today. Scripturally, this is the same place that Ahia knew Edom would be at as well. Continue, please. Come to Zarephath. That's in the land of Israel. Come to Sephirot. Come to Ashkenaz. Come to Germania. And of course, the land of Germany. So Ahia knew where Edom would be. So that scripturally, one can understand who the people that are claiming to be the actual Jews in the land of Israel and also the ones that came from the land of Ashkenaz, which is Germany, along with the ones that call themselves Sephardic. Today, as Yahshua said in Luke chapter 21, verse 24, Jerusalem will be trodden of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So scripturally, it's entirely accurate that the Gentiles are dwelling in the land of Israel and they, the ones that claim to be Jews are the synagogue of Satan that Yahshua foretold. Continuing to get understanding of what would be befalling the Israelites, can we look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 38 to 40, please? Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 38. Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field, and gather, and shalt gather but little in, for the locust shall consume it. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shalt neither drink of the wine, nor gather the grapes. 
for the worm shall eat them. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coast. For thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil. For thine olive shall cast its fruit. The earth will be fighting against it. Right. Continue, please. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. I'll enslave your children are taken away from you and enslaved. Also, truly being enslaved in prison for our iniquities that the unclean spirits had led us to do, to be put into bondage by the sins they have led us to commit. Continue in verse uh, 42 to 44, please. All thy trees and fruit of thy land shall the locusts consume. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. So that's interesting because the nations will get to have success wherever we are, and we will end up being lower, even though we were the ones originally there. Even when slavery was abolished, other nations were brought into the lands where we were at, and profited from the availability of jobs and received benefits instead of us, and were under their hands. For example, you had Ellis Island, the European immigrants brought to replace the Israelite labor force. Then you had the Hindus of India down in the islands like Trinidad, for example. Then you had the Europeans and the East Asians brought into Sub-Saharan Africa. Like, for example, you have Uganda and South Africa. And then you have the world powers also have dominion over Polynesia, Melanesia, and Macronesia. And they profit off of it, but the, the locals, the aboriginals, and the indigenous of the land, they are not profiting. They are being pushed inland while tourism is prospering for the nations on the outskirts. And this is consistent where the Israelites are around the world, as far as those that live on islands and whatnot. I came from the island myself, so I grew up in that. Let's continue verse 45, please. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee, and shall pursue thee, and overtake thee, till thou be destroyed. Because thou hearkenest not to the voice of Ahiah the Elohim, to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder, and upon thy seed forever. Because thou servest not Ahiah the Elohim with joyfulness, and with gladness of heart, with abundance of all things. Right. That's interesting that he didn't do it with joyfulness and gladness of heart because he talks about in Isaiah chapter 1 if we be willing and obedient. Right. So you can see how it's not merely just saying we're being, we're doing the law, but also where's our heart in it as well? Is it a joy? Are we truly willing, not resistant? Are we acquiescent without protest to his will? And are we content with his will? So it's more than just, oh, I keep the Sabbath, for example. Is, is this really a joy for us? Are we doing it from our heart? Because that's the first and great command. We should love Ahayadai Allah with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind and all thy strength. So you can see how what we are being afflicted for is, it also tied back to the fruits of the Spirit, dealing with the inner man. Continue, please. On verse 48. Therefore shalt thou serve thy enemies, which Ahiah shall sin against thee in hunger, and in thirst, and in nakedness, and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck, until he have destroyed thee. That is so interesting. That's physical and spiritual. We have, we know the physical part that happened. But looking at it spiritually, shall serve your enemies, which I have shall send against thee. We've seen he gave us into the hand of the angels. Right? In hunger, we have no bread. We have we don't have Yashi, the bread of life. And in thirst, we don't have the living water. We don't have his blood that's drinking deep. And in nakedness, we don't have the garments of righteousness. And in want of all things. Now, that was interesting because Yahweh says, Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness and all and things will be added unto you. You see what we're really lacking. Because these words are spirit in their light. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck. What's that yoke of iron? The bondage Bond. of iniquity. The yoke that Yahweh came to break. To undo the heavy burden. And that yoke that Satan put upon us, which is through our lust, he'll keep it on us until he destroys us. His goal is to run us right off that cliff and kill us. 
So you can see how these curses are still working against us today. And hopefully through understanding the spiritual understanding, it helps one better look at oneself to overcome these curses. And that bondage, that yoke of Satan is not only afflicting the Israelites, it's afflicting all nations. So it's for our brothers and sisters to take heed to and look at oneself with um, self-assessment to overcome. Now, on the physical aspect, every place we went, the nations that came to us did not come with our best interests at heart, whether under the guise of exploration or missionary work or just a military conquest. The mission was to subdue us according to prophecy. Can you read Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 49, please? Ahia shall bring the nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flyeth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Now notice he said a nation. We know we have the beast of Daniel, right? We right. have the Babylonians, the medo Persian, the Greeks, the Romans. We know we were given into the hands of the 70 nations, right? But he said a nation. If there will come a time there will be one nation that would for this affliction more than any other, and that's chief in this affliction. Let's look from what he said to identify that nation scripturally. He said they'll be as swift as the eagle flyer. Of course, with the Daniel, there was an understanding to it that was not revealed to Daniel, but was revealed to Ezra to help understand who that one was that was swift as an eagle. Can you read Second Ezra, you know, chapter 11, verse 1, please, and then chapter 12, verse 9, please. Second Ezra, chapter 11, verse 1. Then saw I a dream, and behold, there came up from the sea an eagle, which had twelve feathered wings and three heads. Right, that eagle, by looking at the precepts, that was Rome. Now we're going to see there's more to this. Can you read chapter 12, verse 9 of Second Edges, please? For thou hast judged me worthy to show me the last time. Now this is after Edris, Edris has seen that vision of that eagle. I had judged him worthy to see the last times. To understand who that ego was and know what was going to be happening in the last times, Ezra was also shown what nation that would be in the end of the world. Second Ezra chapter 6 verse 9, please. For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followed. That was a nation that would be in the last times, ruling. Now, to see that ego was the ego that was not revealed to Daniel in his vision, can you read Second Ezra chapter 12 verse 11, please? The eagle whom thou sawest come up from the sea is the kingdom which was seen in the vision of thy brother Daniel. So we see that's what Daniel saw, but it wasn't revealed to him. And you can confirm that they shall crown wickedness and set up matters of impurity in the guise of purity, as Gad mentioned in his book by what was revealed to Daniel in his book in Daniel chapter 8, verse 23. Where he said, and in the latter end of their kingdom. This is speaking of the kingdom of Edom, who would be ruling in the end of the world. They had been in power since the days of the Grecians. And the Romans, though they were impoverished for a time and had to raise back up in the Holy Roman Empire to reclaim their dominion. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And we know that speaking of the false prophet, you can review the lesson on who is the little horn for understanding of that. We had the lesson on the uh, four beasts of Daniel to see that scripture, that fourth kingdom after the Grecians were the Romans. When you look in the book of Maccabees, some of what was not told right there in the scripture of Daniel and whatnot was that Edom became one kingdom with the Romans. Because the Romans are the children of Chittim. But they became one kingdom and had their government. With the children of Edom before they came to power. Can you read Joshua chapter 10 verse 16 to see that the children of Chittim are the Romans? At least Joshua chapter 10 verse 16. And the children of Chittim are the Romans who dwell in the valley of Canopia by the river of Tibur. Right, that's in Italian. Now can you look at Joshua chapter 90 verse 30 and 31 to see that they became one kingdom with Edom. So by the time that Rome got their empire, Edom was synonymous with Rome. And then continue, please. Joshua chapter 90, verse 30. He then heard that Edom had revolted from under the hand of Chittim, and Latinus went to them, and smote them, and subdued them, and placed them under the hand of the children of Chittim. And Edom became one kingdom with the children of Chittim all the days. So it became one kingdom. And notice 
The bloodline Romans are the children of Chittim. And in the scripture, they're constantly referred to as the children of Chittim. But they also had Edom become one kingdom with them. Continue, please. And for many years, there was no king in Edom. And their government was with the children of Chittim and their king. Now, I had said they would be swift as an eagle in Deuteronomy 28, 49. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 4 helps understand again that that nation is Edom. Please. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 1. The vision of Obadiah. Thus saith Adonijah Ahiah concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from Ahiah, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 4. Though thou exalted thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith Ahiah. So, scripturally, there are many nations that are in agreement with our demise to cut the children of Israel off from being a nation. And the tabernacle of Edom is chief, as we read in Psalms 83. Particularly Amalek, his nation of the children of Edom, is the most unrighteous of the seed of Edom, according to scriptures. Edom... Sadly, scripturally, they're bent on destroying the children of Israel. There were some choices made early on in the lives of the children of Esau that has affected their posterity, and it's continuing on to this day. Uh, can you read Psalms 137, verse 7, please? Remember, O Ahiah, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem. Who said, raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. Yeah. When Jerusalem was being sacked, they were saying, completely destroy it. All the way to the foundation. Let there not be a remnant. And that's why when one can look at the atrocities of slavery and the American Holocaust and the Australian things that happened with the aboriginals, one would wonder, how can someone do this to a people? The goal was to completely destroy us. That was the motive that was the plan hence one sees such atrocities happen all right continue please O daughter of babylon who ought to be destroyed happy shall he be that rewardeth thee if thou hast saved us now going back to deuteronomy the son deuteronomy 28 49 it would be a certain nation that he was sent as swift as the evil whose tongue we should not understand that nation, we can continue to learn about that nation in verse 50, please. A nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of old, nor show favor to the young. That nation of fierce countenance, specifically when looking at the different nations, the children of Edom were identified as a fierce people. According to Jubilees chapter 19 verse 13. They are expert in war. All their deeds are fierce, according to Jubilees 19 and 14. That's why nobody can overcome them militarily, just trying to fight them. And you've seen it because they rule the world today. Can you look at Jubilees chapter 19, verse 13 and 14, please, to see that this nation is fierce nation? Jubilees chapter 19, verse 13. Excuse me. And in the 43rd Jubilee, in the second week, in the third year thereof, Rebekah bare to Isaac two sons, Jacob and Esau. And Jacob was a smooth and upright man, and Esau was fierce, a man of the field and hairy, and Jacob dwelt in tents. And the youth grew, and Jacob learned to write, but Esau did not learn, for he was a man of the field and a hunter, and he learned war, and all his deeds were fierce. That's why. That nation, now I say, is a nation of fierce countenance. If you look at the colonization of the world, if you look at even scripturally how the Roman Empire took over, even when Alexander started, because Alexander was known for his military exploits too, because he was an Edomite, took over very swiftly. And then when Rome took over, I think it's about First Maccabees chapter eight. You can read how Judas was talking about all the exploits they did. Mighty nations, they were tearing them up because Edom was fierce and Edom was prophesied to live by the sword. That's why to this day people try to fight against Edom. It's a tough case because when not serving Yache, one cannot overcome Edom. They are who they are. They're a very mighty nation in warfare. And uh, that's also going to be shown here in these end times when the times come when the Gentiles start to destroy the children of Israel.
continuing to look at how this nation is fierce. Why is Edom looked at as, as such a fierce nation? Amos chapter 1 verse 11 and Ezekiel chapter 35 verse 12, please. Amos chapter 1 verse 11. Thus saith Ahiah, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Because he did pursue his brother with the sword, and did cast off all pity, and his anger did tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. So we see how sadly Esau went away from the fruits of the Spirit. There was no pity, and his wrath has continued, and it certainly his children from the choices that were made. Continue verse 35 and 12 of Ezekiel, please. And thou shalt know that I am Ahiah, and that I have heard all thy blasphemies which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are laid desolate, they are given us to consume. And this is how one can understand how they had the mindset to do what they did in the atrocities of slavery and colonization around the world. They felt that the Israelites belonged to them. That were cattle. Right. And think of all Gentiles as cattle. Right. And that's where they get the mindset from. Right. That's how the synagogue of Satan thinks. Though not every person of the lineage of Edom thinks like that. Continue verse 35 and 10 of Ezekiel, please. Because thou hast said, These two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess it, where the high up was there. That also helps understand who went to say they are the Jews and take over the land of Israel in recent times in 1948. The children of Edom said, that land was theirs. They felt Israel and Judah, the land and the people, belonged to them. Hence, the people known as the Jews today, as the Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews and whatnot, they have profited the most from the uh, transatlantic slave trade. And also, they have taken the land for themselves. Well, it's scripturally, it's not uh, difficult to understand who is in the land of Israel, who's taking it as their own and claiming it to be their homeland. Yeah, today. Sadly, we're seeing how Edom had made bad choices. Their wrath continued forever. They cast off all pity. They didn't abide in the fruits of the Spirit. Spoken of in Romans chapter 12 by Paul about not taking vengeance for ourselves. That struggle with taking vengeance is it's scripturally understood. Can you read Ezekiel 25 and 12 to see that that was what the mistake that they made, please? Taking vengeance. Thus saith Adonai Ahiah, Because that Edom have dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance, and have greatly offended, and revenged himself upon them. You see, that was a great mistake. And notice he said that the house of Judah, because the inhabitants of the southern kingdom, those who are in sub-Saharan Africa, they experience a worse experience than the other tribes in regards to being persecuted or enslaved and destroyed by the children of Edom. Yet, we are called not to walk in this way. This is for all nations, including the children of Edom that may be listening. Our calling is to not walk with the arrows of our forefathers. As we've talked about before, how Leviticus 26 talks about if we confess our iniquities and the iniquities of our fathers, he would turn our captivity. This goes for all nations. So for the brothers and sisters of the children of Esau, this is opportunity for all of us. Our fathers made mistakes, your fathers made mistakes. We have an opportunity to repent, confess the sins of our fathers and move forward and separate ourselves from them. Uh, this we're called to walk in the fruits of the Spirit as we can see the admonitions. Can you read um, Romans chapter 12, verse 20 and 21, please? Romans chapter 12, verse 20. And therefore, thy enemy hunger feed him, if he thirst, give him drink, for in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And this is a calling for us all, because there, sadly, through what has happened, the Israelites have grown hatred for Edom and for the nations. Yet, we are supposed to walk in love toward whomever may not have love for us to pour fire, coals of fire upon their hand in hopes of melting their heart so that they may believe on Yahweh. And also the Gentiles who may see that the Israelites don't love them. Also, they view as an enemy, give, give them drink, feed them, pour hot coals upon their head to melt their heart. So it's 
are calling for all nations, whether Hebrew or whether Gentile, to walk in the fruits of the Spirit and love our enemies to overcome, because doing good overcomes evil, as opposed to rendering evil for evil by hating someone because they hate us. Can you read verse 21 of Romans 12, please? Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. This admonition helps us go into the covenant that was made between Jacob and Esau. And this is important to touch on because there's been a lot of history between the children of Jacob and the children of Esau. Yet, they have not been told as for many to know that there was a covenant between these two brothers by both their parents that is supposed to be honored today. So we can better understand how we, the children of Israel, are supposed to interact with our brother, the children of Esau, our brothers and our sisters of the children of Esau, because they are also the children of our same father, Isaac, and our same mother, Rebecca. And for those who don't know, if you read Genesis chapter 25, verse 24 to 26, you can see that Jacob and Esau are twin brothers. Okay, so you have scriptural reference for that. You can visit the playlist Gentiles Edification for the lesson Understanding Edom to see the commandments given from Isaac and Rebekah for both Jacob and Esau on the love we're supposed to have between each other as brethren to understand how we are to operate with each other. And we really encourage you, both children of Jacob and children of Esau, to watch that lesson because there's a covenant that our father Isaac made for both of us that if either one of us seeks to injure or wishes harm towards one another, what will come upon us? Can you read Jubilees chapter 36, verse 9 to 11, please? Verse 9. And if either of you devise evil against his brother, know that from henceforth, every one that devises evil against his brother will fall into his hand, and will be rooted out of the land of the living, and his seed will be destroyed from under heaven. So either one of us, Jacob or Esau, if we desire evil against each other, we're going to fall into each other's hand. One way or another, rendering evil for evil will lead to our demise. Continue, please. But on the day of turbulence and execration and indignation and anger, with flaming devouring fire as he had burnt Sodom, so likewise will he burn his land and his city and all that is his, and he will be blotted out of the book of the discipline of the children of men, and not be recorded in the book of life, but in that which is appointed to destruction, he will depart into eternal execration, so that their condemnation may be always renewed in hate and in execration, and in wrath, and in torment, and in indignation, and in plague, and in disease forever. I say and testify to you, my sons, according to the judgment which will come upon the man who wishes to injure his brother. That is a very straight warning for all of us, the children of Jacob and the children of Esau, to see that if we don't ascribe and fulfill the words of our father Isaac, these torments will come upon us. This also helps understand in the law why we were commanded not to hate an Edomite, because that will cause us to transgress the covenant made with our, our father Isaac and our mother Rebecca. Hopefully visiting that lesson Understanding Eden will help with edification on the love our parents Rebecca and Isaac require us to have towards one another as brethren of the children of Jacob and Esau. And also we don't treat anyone bad because Ahaya is a love of strangers and also we ought to be too. In Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 18 and 19 please. He doeth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow, and loveth the stranger and giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. So therefore us, knowing we have been strangers, we've been brought captive to a place we've been mistreated, therefore we also ought to love others knowing that we know how it feels to be mistreated ourselves. Especially knowing that we've been mistreated for our iniquities. And through Yahshua shedding his blood for us, it is through his love that we have been forgiven and have this opportunity to return onto the faith and righteousness with affection of our fathers. Therefore, knowing that we've been forgiven of much, we love the more, as Yahshua testified. But going back to the curses of this fierce nation, sadly, the curses show that they have destroyed us for our sins. And it's come to pass. We are a product of it. Deuteronomy is going to read from 51 
All the way to 61. Deuteronomy 28, verse 51. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of thy land, until thou be destroyed. Which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thy kind, or flock of thy sheep, until he have destroyed thee. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates, until thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustest. Throughout all thy land, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which Ahayah the Allahim hath given thee. And thou shalt eat of the fruit of thy own body, in the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which Ahayah the Allahim hath given thee, in the siege and in the straightness, wherewith thy enemy shall distress thee. Josephus gave account of that in 70 AD when Jerusalem got sacked. Okay. And we just read it in uh, how that happened in the Babylonian captivity too. When people were eating the flesh of their children. And Deuteronomy 28 and 54. So that the man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eyes shall be evil toward his brother, and toward the wife of his bosom, and toward the remnant of his children which he shall eat, so that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children whom he shall eat, because he hath nothing left him in the siege, and in the straightness, wherewith thy enemy shall distress thee in all thy gates. The tender and delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eye shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom, and toward her son, and toward her daughter. And toward her young, and toward her young one that cometh out from between her feet, and toward her children, which she shall bear, for she shall eat them for want of all things, secretly in the siege and straightness, wherewith thy enemy shall distress thee in thy gates. If thou would not observe to do the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, Ahiah thy Alahim. Then Ahia will make thy plagues wonderful, and the plagues of thy seed even great plagues, and of long continuance, and sore sicknesses, and of long continuance. Now yeah, that's interesting that thou let us know that first nation, Ahia sent them to afflict us, right? We were eating our children in the seas in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And he said he'll make the plagues wonderful, that it's going to get unique, it's going to be unlike any other. And the plagues of thy seed, so it's going to go and affect your children. Right. Hence, we've seen we've continued to be in this affliction. And very even great plagues, so it's going to be greater than what was happening before. And of a long continuance, we've been getting afflicted from back then, even until this day. And of sore sicknesses, there's been disease upon disease, even new diseases that's been coming upon us. And of a long continuance. This was showing that this Ahaya knew that when that nation's time came, sadly, we will still not repent after being afflicted initially, and it will get worse upon us. Right? Continue, please. Uh, Deuteronomy 28 and 60. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou was afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Right? Also every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, then will I bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. That's very interesting because these witchcrafts that they're doing, these diseases that they're creating, I have said he would bring diseases that weren't even mentioned in this book. These new diseases that are being brought upon us, these are still a part of the curses up to this day. Zika, Ebola, they are creating these things to continue to destroy us. Continue please. Deuteronomy 28 and 62. And ye shall be left few in number, whereas ye were as the stars of heaven for multitude, mm -hmm. because thou wouldest not obey the voice of Ahiah the Elohim. And that prophecy also foretold that there will be a remnant of us in the end. These curses were foretelling them all the way up until the end of the world. But if we be left few in number, that 144,000, the remnant of the house of Israel. Continue, please. Deuteronomy 28 and 63. And it shall come to pass that if Ahiah rejoice over you to do good and to multiply you, so Ahiah will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught, and ye shall be plucked from off the land, whether thou goest to possess it. He used to rejoice to do his good when we were in Jerusalem. He brought us out from Egypt and everything. There will come a time when he rejoiced to do us evil. 
as we read how when he gave us over to the nations in uh, the book of Enoch, he rejoiced at our destruction. And he, and he tells here in Deuteronomy 63 that he will pluck us off the land. So you see, that's when we get kicked out of the land of Israel. Now he's telling what will come up. He's going back to that time from when we get kicked out of the land and what will befall us. Continue, please. And the highest shall scatter thee among all people, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other. That's letting us know we'll end up going everywhere in the earth, not just within the four corners of the earth in the allotment of the sons of Noah. All right, continue, please. And there thou shalt serve other Elohims, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. That has come to pass. We've given over to idolatry, whether literally with the religions of the world and also with the imaginations of our hearts, which has been also idolatry from within. Continue, please. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the soul of thy foot have rest. But a highest shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. And that holds true to this day that Israelites are still in fear for their lives when amongst the nation. Continue, please. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shall have none assurance of thy life. You can find the fear of police brutality and fear of being mistreated in society is also a part of the curses upon the children of Israel. Continue, please. In the morning thou shalt say, where Allah it were even. And at even thou shalt say, where Allah it were morning. For the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. And the highest shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships, by the way whereof I spake unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again. That let us know when we're going to those ships, that captivity to spread us all over the earth from one end of the earth unto the other, that will be our last captivity that we'll go into them. When we would be taken in ships by that fierce nation who was prophesied to come against us. And it's truly a sign upon the children of Israel because the countries of the Ten Horns, like Portugal, Spain, Britain, and the Dutch countries, and France, they really came to the places where the children of Israel were to take them in slavery. Because Edom felt, as Ahiah said, that these two nations were given him in possession and took them on ships. You have the natives from the Americas being taken on ships to Europe. In the West Indies, they were taking those natives on ships from island to island. You have what they call black burden in the Pacific Islands. And then you have from Sub-Saharan Africa and the slave coast where the inhabitants of Jerusalem were taken on slave ships all over the world to scatter us, as Ahiah said he would do as a part of the curses. Continue, please. And there you shall be sold unto your enemies for bond men and bond women, and no man shall buy you. Now, what's very interesting here, when we go from 64 to 68, he said he would scatter us among our people from one end of the earth unto the other. In order to put us all over the world, you needed ships. <laughs> so, going from there to sea, he said what he was going to do, and then verse 65 shows how when being taken into slavery and being colonized, that whole experience is documented right there from 65 to 68. And among all the nations, you'll find no ease, neither the soul of your foot have rest. You're being worked till you basically die. Some people were worked to death. And I have to give you that trembling heart of failing of eyes and sorrow of mind, and your life shall hang in doubt before you. When the colonizers came to the Americas, the Caribbean islands, the Pacific and Indian Ocean, and Sub-Saharan Africa, the children of Israel, lives literally hung in doubt. They didn't know whether they were going to live or die. And thou shalt fare day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. In the morning you shall say, Wood to Allah Haim were even, because you're being afflicted all day. And in the evening thou shalt say, Wood to Allah Haim it were morning, for the fear of thy heart, wherewith thou shalt fare, for the sight of thy eyes, which thou shalt see. You can see how that was explained, that experience of slavery. And I shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. The word Egypt is misorim. That's bondage, affliction, tightness. That's what we were brought into all over the world. By the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. And there thou shalt be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. We were literally sold on this. We were the first uh, item of the uh, stock market. We have the black burden in the uh, Pacific and Indian Ocean Islands. When Columbus and came to the Americas, they were taking the natives on their ships from different islands and also from the Americas and whatnot. And some 
were taken from the Americas over to Europe. We all experienced it. Just some of us experienced being on literal ships at a greater capacity than others, specifically speaking of the inhabitants of the Southern Kingdom. So hopefully that helps identify the children of Israel and the earth by the courtesy that will be upon them. Going forward now, we're going to go into seeing who the children of Israel are individually, as in the individual tribes that these people come from. Because you can identify who they are by the curses, the characteristics, and whatnot. The places that they were taken to. Right. The inhabitants of the southern kingdom, Judah, Benjamin, Levi, remnant of Simeon, and remnant of the ten tribes. So those people from sub-Saharan Africa would have a higher probability of being from Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. And if not, as maybe Simeon, and then you just have to check the other tribes. Now, the inhabitants of the Caribbean islands, Pacific islands, Indian Ocean islands, and the Americas, they are from the ten tribes of Israel. Those aboriginals and indigenous peoples, one will have to look at the prophecies concerning them. Then you read the book of the Twelve Patriarchs, to identify the individual tribe they're from because the spirit knoweth all things because that way of identifying them through the spiritual obstacles that they face is how one can know what tribe they're from and when we go forward we're going to look at that I will be gracious to give understanding on it so that we can truly identify who the individual 12 tribes of Israel are in the earth today you may have heard of the 12 tribes chart and things of that nature these things are not entirely accurate there's some they get they get you in range but they're not entirely accurate because all the people that's in America all the slaves that's in America all the slaves are not the children of Judah and all the people that are in the island of Jamaica are not the children of Benjamin so you can understand that it's got some accuracy but it's not entirely accurate but when going according to the spirit one can truly identify what tribe people are truly from no matter where they are in the world because <laughs> once you're from that tribe that spirit is it knows who you are and is the one that your father forewarned you about and is the one that's going to give you a struggle hence you have to know which one you're from now, you got to remember that even those of the southern kingdom they were taking their slave ships too, so you'll find remnants of them in America. Everybody is just spread out. Just like he said, you know, you find remnants of Benjamin, Levi, and Judah within the yeah. islands and the Americas and were spread out to the four corners of the earth. So it's just not only the ten tribes that you'll find in the American in the island areas. You'll find it all spread out throughout the four corners of the earth. So you really have to identify them by what their forefathers told them to look out for. So that's what we're going to be going into in the next lessons and we'll be breaking down these tribes so that people can identify the tribes and the things that are going on with them so that they can know what tribe they're from and identify how to overcome the evil spirits that are attacking them. So this is all for building and it's all for strengthening Israel and also for strengthening the Gentiles as well. Because I know the Gentiles, they're going to be having struggles with some of these spirits too because these spirits attack everybody. So we hope you enjoyed the lesson and we thank you for partaking with us and, and you know, learning with us. May you be blessed. All right. Yeah. You got anything else? Um just want to touch on why is it so important to end up identify what tribe one is from. It's essential because we have to honor our father. Our fathers gave us specific instructions to overcome the spiritual battles that we're in, as Zachwa was speaking on. Without knowing what tribe one is from, we're going to continue to struggle. That's why it's so important for the children of Israel to know exactly what tribe they come from. So that one can identify. It's not about who we just care about what nation we're from. This is essential for us to literally come out of our iniquity. To know what tribe we're from through faith in the answer. Alright, everybody. Bless you all in the name of Ahaya Lahayam and may you all be at peace. Shout out to Chala. Shout out to Chala.